Hello, welcome to the course SJPHY1B01 Mechanics 1. The contents of this course is taken from an introduction to mechanics by Kluckner and Kolenko. We will continue to discuss topics from chapter 3, Momentum. In the last class, I have introduced the concept of center of mass. So if you want to analyze the motion of a multi-particle system, for example, a collection of particles. Okay. So here analysis is going to be very difficult. Or even if you take an extended body, as we know, Newton's laws are originally derived for point masses. So you cannot directly apply Newton's laws onto an extended body. So what you do, you will assume that an extended body is made up of a large number of tiny particles. Now you have a system of particles apply Newton's laws onto each of the particles. So if you have a system of n particles, you write down n equations of motion and trying to solve these n equations simultaneously. Predictably, this is a tedious task. So you are looking at ways to <coughs> analyze the motion of the system as a whole. So that's where the, uh, the relevance of center of mass comes into picture. So here you are trying to reduce a multi-particle system into a single particle system. What's the advantage? Instead of dealing with n equations of motion, now you have to deal with only a single equation of motion, the equation of motion of the center of mass. Once you solve the equation of motion of the center of mass, you get an idea about the overall motion of the system. Okay. Now, let's see how to calculate center of mass for a practical situation. Take the case of a drum major's baton. So this is an example discussed in the textbook. And as you know, this textbook is written by foreign authors. So most of the examples they discuss, it may not be familiar to you, but just try to understand. Let's try to understand the physics behind these examples. Okay. A uh, drum major is, uh, is a leader of a band. Okay, so the major, uh, he will be parading in front of the band and he has a baton in his hand. Once in a while, uh, the major will throw the baton into the air. So this is the drum major's baton. It has two end masses. Usually one mass is heavier than the other one. And there is a connecting rod. So let's say the masses are M1 and M2, which are connected through a rod of length L. And as I said, the baton is thrown into the air intermittently. And we are asked to find out the equation of motion for a center of mass. So let's now convert this problem into the language of classical mechanics. I have two masses M1 and M2 separated by a distance L. For the sake of simplicity, I will assume that the mass of the rod is negligible. Okay. Now, what's the first thing we have to do? We have to locate the position of the masses, right? So invoke a coordinate system. You can invoke any coordinate system. Then you draw the position vector. So let me say R1 is the position vector of M1 and R2 is the position vector of M2. And we know how to calculate the position vector of the center of mass, right? This is summation over j m j r j divided by total mass capital M. Since we have two masses m1 and m2, position vector r of the center of mass is m1 r1 plus m2 r2 divided by m1 plus m2. In the last class, when we calculated center of mass of two masses, we have seen that if the masses are equal, then the center of mass will be at the midpoint. If not, then the center of mass will be shifted towards a heavier mass. In both cases, center of mass lies on the line joining the two masses, right? That is a common sense, but let's prove that mathematically. Okay. Now, let's start with the assumption that center of mass does not lie on the line connecting masses M1 and M2. So R is the position vector of the center of mass. So let's say, let's suppose that the tip of R does not lie on the line. 
So let's redraw our configuration once again. I have m1, m2 denoted by position vectors r1, r2. And let's say this is the position vector of the center of mass and I will assume that the tip of the position vector does not lie on the line connecting these two masses. Let me say the vector from the tip of R vector to M1 is R1 prime and from the tip to M2 is R2 prime. And what will be this length connecting M1 and M2? This is R1, this is R2 and using the rules of vector summation, you will know that this is R1 minus R2. Ah. Let's first take this triangle. So once again, apply the rule of vector summation. Capital R plus R1 prime is going to be R1 or I can write R1 prime equal to R1 minus R. Same way from this triangle, I can write capital R plus R2 prime is R2 or R2 prime is R2 minus R. Substitute for R using this equation, then you get R1 prime equal to R1 minus M1 R1 divided by M1 plus M2 minus M2 R2 divided by M1 plus M2. When you simplify this, you get R1 prime equal to M2 divided by M1 plus M2 into R1 minus R2. Same way, when you, when you substitute for R in the second expression, you get R2 prime equal to R2 minus M1 R1 divided by M1 plus M2 minus M2 R2 divided by M1 plus M2. This is going to be negative of m1 divided by m1 plus m2 into r1 minus r2. In both cases, you can note that r1 prime and r2 prime are proportional to r1 minus r2. And what is r1 minus r2? This is the vector connecting these two masses m1 and m2. So since R1 prime and R2 prime are proportional to R1 minus R2, it also means that this being a vector, R1 prime and R2 prime lie on the line connecting the masses M1 and M2. So in other words, the center of mass lies in the line joining the two masses M1 and M2 or the tip of the R vector lies on the line connecting these two masses. Now, if you look at the magnitude of R1 prime and R2 prime, so magnitude of R1 prime is going to be magnitude of this entire thing. This is M2 divided by M1 plus M2 into magnitude of R1 minus R2. And what is magnitude of R1 minus R2? This is the separation distance between these two masses, which is length of the rod L, right? So you can write R1 prime equal to M2 divided by M1 plus M2 into L. Same way, R2 prime equal to minus M1 divided by M1 plus M2 into L. Now, we need to understand what is the motion of a center of mass. So what do you do? First, you have to identify what are the forces acting on the center of mass, then you write down the equation of motion. Right? Now, for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that uh, the, the air resistance or friction with the air is negligible. So the only force acting on the, the baton are the gravity acting on the individual masses. So gravity on mass M1 is M1g and the gravitational force on the mass M2 is M2g. So the total force, total external force is M1g plus M2g. Now you can write down the equation of motion of the center of mass F equal to ma or F equal to mr double dot. F is M1 plus M2 into g, capital M. Total mass is M1 plus M2 is multiplied by r double dot or r double dot equal to g. Even though you have you are dealing with a system of two particles, you are able to reduce it to a system of single particle and that is characterized by a single equation. Now you can solve this. Uh, how, how you do that? This is a simple second order differential equation. You need to integrate it twice. Usually you will have uh, constants of integration 
as I said before, you can calculate the values of these constants using initial condition. For now, let's not bother about this unknown constant. You just simply integrate it twice. So integration with respect to time once will give you gt. When you integrate it once again, you get gt square by 2. So basically, you have a second order equation, r equal to gt square. And what's the form of the solution? y equal to x square. This is the general equation for a parabola, right? So basically, the center of mass is going to follow a parabolic trajectory of a single mass in a uniform gravitational field. So when the major throws the baton into the air, it is going to rotate. So if you try to monitor the locations of the individual masses, this is going to be pretty complicated because at each point, the orientation of the baton is different. So if you try to monitor the individual masses, that's going to be a tedious approach. On the other hand, when you monitor the center of mass, you will notice that it follows a simple parabolic motion. That's why whenever you want to analyze the motion of a multi-particle system, instead of trying to monitor the individual particle, it is always easier to monitor the motion of the center of mass because that will give you a general idea about the motion of the system as a whole. So this is the, the importance of the concept of center of mass. Now for a system of particles, determination of center of mass is a straightforward process, but when it comes to an extended body, what do we do? So as I said in the beginning, you can divide the body into n mass elements. Let's say Rj is the position vector of the jth mass element whose mass is mj. Now following the standard definition of center of mass, now you can write r equal to 1 over m summation over j mj rj. The problem is a mass element is not exactly a particle, right? A mass element will have a definite size. When I say particle, usually particle will have negligible size. Now, how do I make my approximation better? You simply increase the number n. So when you increase the number of particles, automatically the size of each particle decreases, right? So in the limit where n approaches infinity, the size of each element approaches zero and the approximation becomes exact. So now my definition of center of mass changes into r equal to limit n tends to infinity 1 over m summation over j mj rj. From calculus, we know that infinite summation is nothing but integration. So limit n tends to infinity summation over j mj rj is nothing but integral r dm, where dm is a mass element of a very negligible size and r is the position vector of that mass element. Now using this integral formula, I can rewrite my center of mass as r equal to 1 over m integral r dm. So this is how you define the center of mass of an extended ball or a continuous mass distribution. And usually you, you calculate this mass element in terms of its volume. So if I say that rho is the density of the body, where rho is the uniform density, and dv is the volume of the mass element dm. As we know, Density rho is nothing but mass divided by volume. So mass I can write as a product of rho and density and volume. So I can say dm equal to rho dv. So in terms of volume, I am going to rewrite my expression as r equal to 1 over m integral r rho dv. So you can, you can define center of mass in terms of a volume integral. A volume integral is something which you encounter very frequently in different areas of physics like classical mechanics or electromagnetism. For example, if you have a collection of charges in a three-dimensional space, the field and potential associated with the charges you always write in terms of a volume integral. On the other hand, if you have charges moving on a surface, on a plane, and on a two-dimensional plane, then you will rewrite your field and potential in terms of a surface integral. If you consider charges moving in a thin wire, thin wire is a, a one-dimensional entity, right? 
In this case, you will write down the field and potentials in terms of a line integral. So this is something you will encounter very frequently. So uh, that's about the center of mass. Now, before winding up the discussion on center of mass, uh, let's see one more example of uh, center of mass motion. So in this case, we are not going to do a detailed quantitative analysis. We are simply going to see, make some qualitative observation. Because many a time what happens is in the midst of all these mathematical equations, we understand physically what is happening in the system. Because sometimes physical arguments are more useful than mathematical analysis. So let's take the case of a rectangular box which is held with one corner resting on a frictionless table. When gently released, it falls in a complex tumbling motion which we are not yet prepared to solve because it involves rotation. So far, all the tools available to us are pertain to the linear motion only. Okay. So we are not going to discuss the complex motion of the box. We are just interested in finding out what is the trajectory of the center of mass because we know once we identify the trajectory of the center of mass, we will get some idea about the overall motion of the object. Right? Now, uh, how do we understand this? First, we need to identify what are the forces acting on the system, right? So, the, the gravitational force is going to act on the center of mass and it always acts in the downward direction. And since the box is in contact with the table surface, there is a normal force exerted by the table onto the object in the upward direction. And if you're considering a uniform box, the center of mass is at the geometrical center. So this is the location of the center of mass. And both the forces are vertical, so we don't have to bother about the horizontal motion. And usually when an object is at rest, the normal force and the weight, they cancel each other. But in this case, as you can see, the line of action of both the forces are different. Therefore, they are not going to cancel each other. So since you have an unbalanced vertical, vertical force acting in your system, you will have a vertical motion. In other words, the center of mass is going to experience a vertical acceleration under the influence of this unbalanced force. Now, what is going to be the motion? The motion will happen in such a way that at the end of the motion, when the object comes into rest position, these two forces will cancel each other, right? Only then the object will come to rest position. So now you can see if the box is released from rest, what happens? It is going to move in such a way that the center of mass falls straight down. So originally, this is the position of the center of mass. And when the box moves and finally settles down on the on the table surface, what happens when you look at the position of the center of mass, it has moved vertically. Now in this position, if you look at the forces here, weight is acting vertically down and the normal force is acting vertically up. These two cancel each other so that the object is at the rest position. Okay. So sometimes by simply monitoring the, the trajectory of the center of mass without doing any detailed mathematical analysis will give you some idea about the motion of the system as a whole. So that's about center of mass. Let's now move on to uh, another very, very important principle in classical mechanics, and that is conservation of momentum. The idea behind this conservation of momentum is very simple, but its implication is very, very profound. Now, if you look at the equation of motion of a multi-particle system, we know that F equal to dP by dt, where F is the total external force acting on the system, and capital P is the total momentum of the system. Now, if F equal to zero, the total external force acting on the system equal to zero, then 
I can say dp by dt equal to zero, which means p is a constant. So this is known as conservation of linear momentum. When the total external force acting on a system is zero, the total momentum of the system remains a constant or it remains conserved. This is conservation of linear momentum. I can restate this in another way. So if you consider an isolated system, isolated system is something which does not interact with the surrounding. Since there is no interaction with the surrounding, the external force from the surrounding is zero. So whenever I say an isolated system, by default, it means that the external force is zero. So for an isolated system, which does not interact with its surrounding, the total momentum always remains a constant, no matter how strong the interactions among the individual particles are, and no matter how complicated their motions are. So this is very important because even though the external force is zero, there are a lot of interaction between the individual particles of the system, right? They will be exerting forces onto each other. They will be moving with respect to each other. So a lot of internal interactions are happening. But still, if, you, if the external force is zero, irrespective of all these internal factors, the total momentum of the system remains a constant. So this is one of the conservation principles in physics. In the next semester, you will learn about conservation of angular momentum and also probably you are familiar with conservation of energy, right? Energy can neither be created nor be destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to other. Right? Now, what is the relevance of all these conservation principles? In the context of classical mechanics, suppose if you want to study the motion of a system, what do you usually do? You apply Newton's laws and you write down the equation of motion, you solve it and get the trajectory of your system, right? If the system is complicated, if there are a lot of forces acting on your system, then writing down the equation of motion is going to be challenging and solving that is going to be even more challenging. So in some cases, the conservation principles help you to analyze the motion of the system without actually solving the equation of motion. Without following a detailed mathematical procedure, conservation principles will be able to give you some useful information about the motion of the system. So this is the, the importance of conservation principles in classical mechanics. I can illustrate this with one example. Let's take, let's take the case of a, a spring gun. So when a spring gun fires the bullet, bullet is also known as marble, so when a spring gun fires a marble, what happens? Marble moves in the forward direction with certain velocity and by Newton's third law, there will be an equal and opposite force acting in the opposite direction and because of that, the gun gets a, a recoil, right? So the recoil happens in the opposite direction of the, the bullet's movement. So let's take a loaded spring gun, which is initially at rest on a horizontal frictionless surface. And this gun fires a marble or bullet at an angle of elevation theta. So theta is the angle with respect to the surface. Let's say the mass of the gun is capital M and the mass of the marble is small m and the muzzle velocity of the marble, velocity of the marble is V0. What is the final? motion of the gun, what's the final velocity of the gun. So first we need to understand that we are talking about a system of two particles or two objects. One is the gun with mass capital M and other is the marble with mass small m. So now let's uh, assume that the mass of the spring is negligible. Second, we need to identify what are the forces acting on the system, right? So here we already assume that the friction is zero. So the only forces that are acting are gravity and the normal force. And both these forces are vertical forces. So that makes our analysis simpler because since there are no horizontal forces, uh, I can 
we can uh, straight away write down the equation of motion in the horizontal direction. So if I say x is the horizontal axis and y is the vertical axis, my equation of motion f is equal to dp by dt in the x direction is going to be the force in the x direction is 0. So 0 equal to dpx by dt where px is the total momentum in the x direction or the horizontal direction. So since the four total force is zero, uh, momentum is a constant, uh, momentum is conserved. So I can say the initial momentum in the x direction is same as the final momentum in the x direction. Okay. Now, what is the initial momentum of the system? Let the initial time be prior to the firing of the gun. Okay. Now, prior to the firing, the system is at rest, right? So when the system is at rest, the initial momentum Px initial equal to 0. When Px initial equal to 0, from the conservation principle, I can write Px final is also equal to 0. Now let's calculate what is the expression for Px final. After the marble has left the muzzle, this is the muzzle, the gun recoils with some speed let's say the speed is vf vf is the recoil velocity so if vs is vf is the recoil velocity then the final horizontal momentum is going to be mvf so remember the, the marble is fired in this direction with velocity v naught and the gun is on the table so when the gun recoils it recoils towards the left with velocity vf Physically, the marble's acceleration is due to the force of the gun and the gun's recoil is due to the reaction force of the marble. So the gun exerts a force onto the marble so that marble is fired with velocity v naught. And by Newton's third law, the marble exerts a force back onto the gun. As a result, the gun recoils with the velocity vf in the negative direction. The gun stops accelerating once the marble leaves the barrel. Right? Therefore, at the instant the marble and the gun part company, the gun has its final speed Vf in the negative direction. And at that same instant, speed of the marble is V0. Now, one thing you have to remember is the speed is defined with respect to the gun. Okay? So this is the relative velocity. If you choose your frame of reference, if you choose your coordinate system as the gun, now there is going to be a small issue because your gun is not a stationary frame. Gun is moving towards the left with the velocity vf. So it's always better to choose a frame which is stationary. So let's choose the table which is not moving as our frame of reference. So v0 is the velocity with respect to the moving gun. Now I need to recalculate the velocity of the marble with respect to the tape. Okay. Now velocity of the gun, the relative velocity of the gun is at an arbitrary angle. I can decompose this into vertical component v0 sin theta and horizontal component v0 cos theta. Right. Now with respect to table, table C is velocity v0 cos theta towards the right and the table also sees that the gun is moving towards the left with velocity vf so by convention the right hand direction is positive left hand direction is negative so with respect to the table the net velocity of the marble is going to be v0 cos theta minus vf okay, so this is the absolute velocity whereas v0 is the relative velocity now, from the conservation principle, since Px initial equal to 0, I know that Px final equal to 0. So, let's calculate what is Px final. So, Px final is the total momentum of the system in the horizontal direction at the final moment, right? So, this is going to be the final momentum of the marble plus the final momentum of the gun. And what is the final momentum of the marble? Mass multiplied by final velocity. This is m into v0 cos theta minus vf. 
And usually V0 cos theta is much higher than Vf, right? The recoil velocity will be always lower than the muzzle velocity. Okay, so the net value of V0 cos theta minus Vf will be positive in the right direction. So the first term is positive and what is the final momentum of the gun mass m multiplied by final velocity vf since vf is in the negative direction we have a minus sign here so minus mvf now you can re expand the right hand side and write zero equal to mv naught cos theta minus m plus m into vf and we are asked to find out the final velocity of the gun, which is Vf. So from this expression, I get Vf equal to mv0 cos theta divided by m plus m. So as you can see, we haven't done any detailed mathematical analysis, right? We just applied the conservation principle and straight away we got the final velocity of the gun. If you want to really appreciate the usefulness of uh, uh, conservation principle what you can do is in the same problem you can arrive at the solution following Newton's laws so what you do you write down the equation of motion then you solve it using appropriate initial conditions right and you are asked to find out velocity so your equation of motion is f equal to ma when you do integration of acceleration you get the velocity so you need to do only one integration okay so you do that as an assignment and you will see how easy you know, the method of conservation principle compared to Newton's. So one thing is you, you cannot apply conservation principles in every system, but whenever possible, it yields the result in a much more convenient, much more faster manner compared to the Newton's law. So that's the relevance of conservation principles in physics. So thus we come to the end of uh, module 1. In the next class, we will start module 2. Thank you.